So with that being said, going on to question number two, do you believe, I think I know the answer to this question, but do you believe that family worship has any significant effect on whether or not a child will grow up to be a Christian? Maybe you can give an example, good or bad or something else. Okay, well, in answer to that, yes, I believe absolutely that family worship uh, has a significant effect on whether or not a child obeys the gospel and is faithful or not. In Proverbs 22 and verse 6, this is a passage that a lot of us are familiar with. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, this is a proverb, and a proverb is a short pithy saying about what generally happens. So generally, however your child is raised up, that's how they're going to continue later in life. And and there are some exceptions. Uh, Another proverb in the next chapter in Proverbs 23 and verse 21, it says, the drunkard and the glutton come to poverty. Well, that's, that's a proverb. And most of the time, that is true. But there are some uh, rich, wealthy gluttons. And there are some rich, uh, wealthy drunkards in the world. But usually, when you become a drunkard or when you become a glutton, you're lazy and your your gluttonous uh, laziness is described in the rest of that verse. Drowsiness will clothe a man in rags. That's, that's laziness. When you're lazy and gluttonous and you're a drunkard, most of the time you're going to end up poor and you're going to be living in, in extreme poverty, but not always. There's a, there's a few that are exceptions. So Proverbs then are telling you generally what happens. And generally when you raise a child up, however it is you raise them up to be, that's what they will be when they leave your house and they're out on their own or when you die and you're gone. And so um, children have free will. God made all of us with free will. And, and I can quit the church today and stop being faithful today. If I did, that doesn't mean my parents raised me up wrong. It means that I, with my own free will, chose to disobey God and, and lose my soul. If you, uh, Aaron Batty, quit the church. You can do that because you have free will and you can quit the church. That doesn't mean Peggy and I raised you wrong. And if we had raised you right, you would have stayed in the church. And we need to be careful in how we use Proverbs 22, 6, or we're going to end up teaching once saved, always saved. Once raised up correctly, always correct. And that's wrong. That's Calvinism. But generally speaking, the Bible teaches that if if children are raised correctly, when they become old enough and they're on their own, they will continue to live the way that they were raised up. And if children learn how to worship at home with their family every morning and every evening with the scriptures on their mind, all through the day with the scriptures on their mind, thinking and 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 remembering god sees me that you think about that all day long everything i'm doing god sees it there's an all-seeing eye watching you as we sing in the old song sometimes and that is what is going to keep our children faithful is is these kind of lessons that we learn in family worship and so Yes, family worship is very significant. It's it's training. It's family train time, training time for life out on our own. And when when the, when the mother and the dad finally kick you out of the house and say, "Go build your own house out there where the big bad wolf lives," uh, hopefully you've learned your lesson and you build a brick house when you get out there. Would you say uh, something came to my mind, I think it was last year, about I mean, going through college. Some young people, they survive college, we say, spiritually, you know, and they're, they're still members of the, say, faithful to the church and all that. Um, some thrive through college, you might say. They uh, Maybe they become better 
person through the whole process, but others just simply survive. You know, they made it through college. Yeah, they still warm a church pew. They still commune on Sunday and so forth, but they didn't really thrive and they never will because of key growth periods where they were starved. Would you say that um, you notice the difference between children that were not raised with with uh, ready reading, prayer, and all that in the home surviving and not thriving? Uh, would that be... I don't know. It's something I've not thought about. Well, I, I, I think that the kids that I know who had daily Bible reading came closer to thriving, if that's the word that sh is, should be used. They came closer to doing that than the ones who, who didn't. Uh, like I say, there's no guarantee when kids leave home, one of the first uh, feelings is I'm free. I'm on my own. I, I can, mom and dad aren't here to watch me. And I think the most important lesson that we can teach is that no, mom and dad aren't there to watch you anymore, but God is watching you. And in Hebrews chapter four, the Bible says that all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to, to do. And so I tried to teach you kids the fact that God is watching. God knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're doing. He knows everywhere you go. He knows everything you say. And you're going to give an account one day before God. You're not going to answer to mom and dad anymore. You're going to answer directly to God. And I think kids need to have that instilled in their thinking in order to survive college or to thrive. And I think also kids need to learn that they're, in, in a sense, they're an evangelist, and their job is to not be influenced by others, but to influence others. And if, if, we, if our kids just leave home with only the thought, I, I'm going to try to resist evil, well, that's good, but they also need to learn that I, my purpose in life is to try to plant the seed and influence other people to become better and Christians. And, and, and uh, I remember times where Jody and Nathan would be out on the uh, driveway playing with the neighbor kids from across the street. And Jody came running in one day and they were having an argument outside. And she said, Daddy, what's that scripture that says you're going to go to hell if, if you uh, have a piano in church? And so, you know, that was a teaching opportunity. I, I would say, well, uh, you know, it's Ephesians 519. And she'd go out there and she would teach those kids. They were, they were going to hell for going to a church that had a piano. And we would talk about uh, a more diplomatic way of teaching some of these lessons to our neighbors. But my point is, Jody and Nathan, who brought up church? Who brought up a piano at church? Was it the neighbor kids? No, they didn't bring that up. It was Jody and Nathan that brought that up because they, they viewed themselves as if I don't teach them this, they won't ever know it. And I think our college students need to realize when you go to college, when you go to high school, if you don't teach your teachers, if you don't teach your fellow students, they won't be taught. And they'll go into eternity having never learned. And so I think that that within itself is a, a it helps to defend you against the world because your purpose is to try to influence them in the world, to, to leave the world and come be part of you. So. Very good. Um, I had a couple of fathers who I had assigned a chapter from Genesis. And as we're going through this 30 days, we're reading through a chapter of Genesis or more trying to get through the whole book in 30 days. So I forgot about, <laughs> I forgot about Lot's daughters. I forgot about Onan. I forgot about, um, probably, I don't know, Rachel and Leah, I think was one that uh, some fathers felt uncomfortable reading with their their children. So 
uh, I think I probably forgot about it because and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't recall. We would read through the Bible every year. And I don't recall us skipping those verses even when I was as small as five years old. I can remember reading along in my Bible. Um, so what's your philosophy? Because I was talking about this with some of the families. I was just interested. I never even thought about not reading these stories. What's your philosophy on reading those stories just for what they are with any aged child in your home? And how do you go about um, all the possibilities of how that conversation might go? I call them rated R Bible stories. Well, to me, if the story is in the Bible, it, it's fair game for a child to learn. And I think that, I think as children grow up and they start asking questions, when they get old enough to start asking those questions, they're old enough to learn the answers to those questions. Like, um, what is a eunuch? A, 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 a four-year-old's not going to ask that question. Probably. There, there might be, and, and having said that, now the next family that reads about Acts chapter 8, their, their three-year-old is going to ask what a eunuch is. But anyway, um, I, I would, you know, I think God, God put it in the Bible. If God put it in the Bible, it is, it's proper to read it in the assembly of the church. It is proper to talk, talk about it at home with your kids. And I think that when we, it's like watching uh, the movie that I talked about a little bit earlier, we would, yeah, we would watch sometimes movies that had killing in the movie and we would stop the, the movie. We'd put it on pause and we'd say, what's the matter? What just happened just now that's wrong? And I think that that's what you need to do when you're reading these stories in the Bible, like the story about um, the concubine in Leviticus chapter 19. You, you read the story and you stop and you ask the kids, what's the matter with what we just read? What's the matter with that? And that gives you an opportunity to teach right from wrong. And I'll guarantee you, kids are learning at very, very early ages in government schools. They are learning a lot about uh, sex that parents would be shocked if they knew their kids were uh learning the things that they're learning at such early ages and and I think cases like for example the story of Phinehas uh taking the spear you know and, and he rams it through the Israelite and the Moabite woman underneath him and he pinned them to the ground that that story needs to be told to our kids because they need to be taught that it is wrong to commit fornication. And, and God blessed Phinehas with a special blessing. He got a special blessing from God for running them through and pinning them to the ground with a spear. And it helps our kids to see this is what God thinks about that sin. And something worse is going to happen to people that do that after they die. Their, their hell is real. And this helps us to see that God is not only a loving God, but God is a holy God. And the holiness of God will not allow these sins to go unpunished. He will not. And the, those stories of uh, Phinehas and, and Jehu and all of those stories like that are stories that remind us of the holiness of God. Um. The stories like Lot's, Lot and his two daughters is a time to explain, you know, what's the matter with this picture? And it's a time to teach little kids that it's wrong for a man to go to bed with a woman that he is not married to. And he was not married to his two daughters. And he, you cannot go to bed with your daughter. You're not married to her. That's wrong to do. And the little kids need to be taught at an early age that daddy and, and uncle Bob and, uh, and, and aunt Mary and uh, grandpa Jones, none of them should be um, exposing themselves to you. None of them should be putting their hands on you and your private parts. And they need to be taught because, unfortunately, we're living in a fallen world. 
where sometimes parents and uncles and grandparents sometimes sexually abuse children and they need to learn. If somebody's putting their hands on your private parts, you need to come tell mom and dad about that. And we need that, that has to stop. That is wrong. And people that do that are going to hell and little kids can understand hell. And they need to understand if somebody's putting their hands on you like that, that, that is a, a hell deserving action. And you need to come tell mom and dad about that. And so I don't think those stories should be um, not told. Uh, we, we shouldn't muzzle the mouth of the scriptures. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as a matter of fact, said, I, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. There, there was nothing that Paul would not teach from scripture. When I tell the Bible stories on Bible story nights, which are advertised at the end of these videos, um, then I always get to part of the story because <laughs> I don't know if the parents want their kids, me telling them all that Samson did in his free time. <laughs> so I say, you'll have to ask your parents about this. So this is free advice and you can take it or leave it. And you can read it explicitly or you cannot. Uh, but this is just some advice. I think it's good advice. I think um, me personally, having read through the Bible since I was before I could even read every single year, I don't ever remember asking questions about what was uh, Lot's daughter doing with her daddy and stuff like that. Maybe I did. Maybe you can give a personal example. But um, I really don't remember asking questions about stuff that was inappropriate until I actually was kind of exposed to that stuff in other areas. So, and I think a lot of parents, you don't realize, uh, well, maybe you do. You just, it's been, it has been a long time since you were a kid and maybe you don't have a good memory that especially kids today, they are being sexualized in their mind way earlier than you think they are. And there are kids that privately get things happen to them that you will never know about until they're adults. And you, it's never happened to you, but it happens. And uh, anyway, I think well, you uh, open your mind a little bit. Yes, and I think that I really think that the television and movies are, and the internet are avenues that the the world is sexualizing our kids. It's sexualizing our church members, uh, us. We get desensitized because we see this stuff all the time, and we start losing our ability to blush. We start. <clears throat> we start losing our ability to be outraged because we're not outraged anymore. We see it everywhere we turn. And when, when kids, I'm, I'm being told, uh, Peg and I don't have uh, a television. We, we have a video player and we watch videos, but, and we see things on the internet when we're looking at news stories. But I'm told that on television, that there is a, a commercial that, uh, you know, you're, you're watching a football game and the football game seems pretty innocent. And, and then a com it's commercial time. And on commercial, there is some advertisement. And in the end, two men end up kissing each other. And subtly, what that's trying to teach is that homosexuality is okay. It's normal. Everybody does it. And if you want to do it, uh, there's nothing wrong with you. And that kind of messaging is happening constantly. And so we need to, we need to have daily worship and daily study with our kids and every day remind our kids that these kind of things are wrong and, and uh, push back against what the world is indoctrinating us oftentimes um, uh, unknowingly. We, we don't, we're not really conscious of the fact that here's one more occasion where the world has just tried to plant the seed into my thinking that it is okay to be homosexual or it's okay to have sex outside of marriage. It's okay to, to drink, uh, to smoke marijuana or whatever it happens to be advertised. We'll call that one good. And we'll move on to the last one. Uh, this is just a point of practical application to fathers who are not used to uh, leading 
family reading and so forth, prayer at home. Um, I've personally had conversations with several in the last couple of years that that was not normal for them. So they have to get past that stage of awkwardness or just familiarity. So what advice would you give to these types of families? There's actually, I mean, there's really probably a lot of people watching this that are single mothers, uh, honestly, and we don't, I don't typically call them out or um, say, you know, single mothers, we always say fathers, but they don't have a father to leave family worship for home. So what would you say to them? So um, not every man, not every Christian man has the ability to stand in the pulpit and preach to the assembly of the church. And not every man should do that because they just don't have that talent. God didn't give them that talent to do that. But surely if a man can father a child and bring a child into the world, he takes upon himself the responsibility of teaching that child. And it is his responsibility. And Surely a father can sit in front of his children and read stories with them and talk about uh, scripture, even if the father can't read. And I know uh, some situations where a father's illiterate and he can't read the Bible, but he can play a Bible tape or he can um, have the mother do the reading. And, or, and, it, and if worse comes to worse, the children can do the reading if they've gone to school long enough to learn how to read. And surely a father can sit in front of his own children. Uh, he has a captive audience. The children live in his house. They have to do what he says. And he needs to do that. But the Bible says in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, you fathers do not provoke your children, wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And if you leave out the words that are in between, it says, you fathers, bring up your children in the training and admonition of the Lord. So fathers, a lot of fathers think, oh, this is women's work. This is the mother's job. And the Bible is placing it squarely in the, in the hands of the father. So my, my advice and encouragement to fathers is to, to wake up and to realize that child rearing is your responsibility and it's your wife's job to be the helper according to Genesis 2 and verse 18. So instead of the wife being the teacher and the father's just the helper, it needs to be the father is the teacher and the wife is the helper. And so I'll add that, that teaching another person a Bible story ends up actually teaching you the storyteller, you learn more than the listener. I find that to be true when, when I have to get up a sermon to teach in the pulpit at church, I'm the one actually that learns more than anybody sitting out there in the pew because I had to think about the scripture and I had to think about what was I going to say? How was I going to say it? And the other people, hopefully they learned something but I'm learning more than they did because I put more effort into it. And I'll guarantee you, when you tell a story to a kid, you all of a sudden realize, I don't know that story quite as well as I thought I did. If you, if you tell the story of Noah and the ark, everybody, oh, everybody knows that story. Well, if you think that way, try telling it to a kid. And all of a sudden you realize, um, I don't know how, how, what were the dimensions of the ark? And what does that mean in today's standard of measurements? Here in America, how long was the ark in feet and inches? How tall was it? How wide was it? How much would it hold? And so if you start studying, it drives you to the Bible, to look in the Bible and, and refresh your memory. Um, how long was Noah in the ark altogether? How long did the rain last? How long did it take for the rain to go away? How long did the ark sit on top of Mount Ararat before Noah came out of the ark? How long was he in the ark? These are the kind of details that people don't really know. And it drives you to the Bible to reconsult the original story in the scriptures. And you end up learning more 
about the Bible, just telling the story to a kid. It's amazing. And so family worship is a time for the whole family to grow. It's not just about the kids. It's about mom and dad. And, and Peggy and I, we have Bible readings and we have Bible discussions between the two of us. And, and uh, sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the questions aren't answered. Sometimes it's questions that I can't answer. And it's, it's questions that each of us need to go and study and ponder on more and then come back and talk about it later on another occasion but it's a time for growing for everybody, mom and dad, the kids, everybody. And when, when, uh, when you kids would have a friend over for the night, occasionally that would happen. When it's time to have Bible reading, that neighbor kid sat there in the family, in the living room, along with the rest of us. And we had Bible reading and we had prayer together. And it was a time for those kids to, those neighbor kids could go home and tell their parents, boy, down there at the batty home, they read the Bible. And, you know, it might be an occasion where the, the neighbors might eventually hear the gospel. It never, it never happened that way in our home, but it was an opportunity. So. I have had several friends, uh, since I've been an adult who had mentioned that I always enjoy coming to your house and staying because you always have family Bible reading and stuff. And they didn't have that with in their home. It took, you know, 10 years for them to tell me that, I guess. <laughs> but anyways, I've had a few of those. I'm glad you mentioned that you and mom still do that together. And y'all did it before. I think I won't mention the author because I'm not sure exactly who it was. But I think he was talking about how families do not start with the first child. Families start with man and wife. And so family worship should start with man and wife. And it's when people get the mindset that it revolves around the child, the child leaves the home, and that's where the marriage falls apart because they think that the child is what made the family. Um, I thought that was interesting. And so I encourage anybody to continue this if you're still an older couple or if you just simply don't have kids, please. One, one thing this. that I, it just kind of came to me that I, I meant to put this in my notes that I was sharing, but I forgot. One important thing about family worship, Bible study, teaching kids. I think kids need to be taught why we believe like we do. Um, I remember growing up sometimes and I was told, you know, it, it's sinful to go to the movie theater. I was taught that. It is wrong to go to the movie theater. It's wrong to go to a football game and watch a football game. And I would ask the question, why? What's the matter with that? And the answer was, it's worldliness. That's, that's worldliness. And we're not worldly people. And we, we can't do that. And I'm thinking, well, what is worldliness? Everything's worldly, it looks like, and, and you can't do anything. And I think that we need to come up with some better reasoning. If we're going to teach our kid that something is wrong, then if something is wrong, that means if you do it and you don't get forgiveness for it, you're going to go to hell. That's what that means, if it's wrong. And if we're going to teach our kids that something is wrong, we need to back it up and prove from logic and from scripture that you're going to go to hell for it if you do it. And just saying it's worldly is a cop out. Kids are not going to buy that when they get up big enough to get out and go to college and they're out on their own. They're, they're not, that's unconvincing. And they're going to have to be truly and thoroughly convinced this is against scripture. And if I participate in it, I can do that for homosexuality. I can do that for fornication. I can show from scripture that adultery is sinful, but I'm not sure that I can do that for the movie theater. And I think that when, I think what we need to do with with movie theaters is we need to tell our children, for example, if, if that's what we want to say, you shouldn't go to the movie theaters. I think we need to say that's not a wise thing to do. 
And here's why I think it's not wise. And, and then give your reasoning. And they understand this, this is not necessarily sinful, but it may not be the best idea either. You know, it, it's not sinful to not go to college and not get a college degree, but it might not be wise to stay out of college, you know, if you have that opportunity. Uh, but I, I guess my point is there's a difference between wisdom issues and moral issues. And I think parents need to be careful that they don't start teaching wisdom issues as if they were moral issues. So. Yes, I'm sure we have a wide blend of family backgrounds. So some of you may not be able to relate to any of that. Some of you can more than relate to it. So um, thank you for your time. Um, is that the last piece of extra insight that you wanted to give? Um, I just wanted to mention, and uh, this is kind of an advertisement, I suppose, but uh, if if somebody's interesting, I have a three-part presentation on child rearing on uh, the church's website, willofthelord.com. There's a little search box off to the right. And if you just go to that little search box and you just type in the word child and then hit search, it'll bring up the uh, postings that we have on our website about child rearing and uh, hopefully maybe that might be some material there that would help some families that are um, interested in, in some insights on that maybe so. very good well thank you again for your time and if you have any questions you're welcome to reach out to George Batty at willowthelore.com or you're welcome to reach out to me as you're on this Live Minute Bible Today channel you know where I'm at We'll call it quits of that, so we'll talk to you later.